Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's take a few moments and roll back the clock about five and a half weeks ago to February 14th. Yes, Valentine's Day. A day to celebrate love. A feel-good day for many people, perhaps enjoying a romantic dinner out with that special person in our lives. But for others, Valentine's Day is something else. Something of a reminder of unfulfilled wishes and dreams. A time of grieving the death of a loved one, someone so very close to us. A painful reminder of broken relationships. February 14th. The day of celebration for the Kansas City Chiefs, players, fans, and coaches. These day, three days earlier, the Chiefs had won the Super Bowl. And this was the day of basking in the victory. Are you feeling good today, Chiefs Kingdom? Kansas City Mayor Quentin Lucas shouted to a sea of football fans uh, fresh off their city's third Super Bowl victory in five years. Less than an hour later, with music still blaring and the confetti of celebration still hanging in the air, the mayor and throngs of others were running from gunfire, unsure of what where it was coming from, desperately seeking safety. One woman was killed, and over 20 people were injured in the mass shooting. February 14th, Ash Wednesday, the day our Lenten journey began, a day of reflection, of contemplation, celebration, and Ash Wednesday are generally not used together in the same sentence. We received the sign of a black ash cross on our foreheads, and we were told, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We were called to enter into the discipline of Lent, to struggle against everything that leads us away from love of God and neighbor. Perhaps over these past five and a half weeks, you have committed yourself to practices such as repentance, prayer, fasting, works of love, opening yourself up to a deeper connection with God, who goes the way of the cross in his son Jesus. Ash Wednesday grounds us in our humanity. We can face the realities of our mortality and our broken condition honestly, confidently, that we have a God who knows all about being human and loves us unconditionally. Now, five and a half weeks later, we begin Holy Week, and we see Jesus coming into Jerusalem with his disciples on this day we call Palm Sunday. There's a feeling of celebration in the air. People were throwing out the leafy green carpet for Jesus, shouting, let's shout it together, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Oh, how these people were looking for a hero, a modern-day David, who could free them from the oppressive power of the Roman Empire and restore Israel to some semblance of those old days of glory when David was king. Even a thousand years later now, after David's time, this was still a part of their collective memory. But Jesus would not be fulfilling their desires for the rebirth of a mighty earthly kingdom. His mode of transportation told the story of his humility and his mission of service. He rode into Jerusalem not on an impressive war horse, 
but on a colt, most likely an animal that was just barely large enough to hold Jesus' weight, even move, moving at a slow pace. I can almost picture Jesus' feet scraping against the cloaks and palm leaves as he rode into Jerusalem on that humble animal. No, this celebration didn't turn out as the general population had hoped. Rather than giving in to the way of temporary glory and personal gratification, a temptation Jesus resisted early on in his ministry, his direction was set on a path that would lead to the cross. The kingdom that Jesus was ushering in was no temporary earthly kingdom. He didn't use his divine power for selfish goals. His mind was fixed on the long-term mission of rescuing the world from the destructive powers of sin. He was calling people to find truly meaningful, fulfilling life in the giver of life. His mind was fixed on changing the world, not by force, but through humble service and self-sacrifice. The Apostle Paul had a clear understanding of Jesus' mission when he wrote to the church at Philippi, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul was writing these words to a group of believers that he loved deeply, but they were not perfect. There were divisions in the Philippian church, and in addressing these divisions, Paul told them to be of the same mind, that is, the mind of Christ. He isn't expecting them to agree on everything, but he is telling them that they need to agree on what is the foundation of their faith, the humble service of Christ, who took on human flesh and blood, experienced human life with all that entails, and suffered and died on behalf of humanity. Paul calls the believers to grow into that same mind of Jesus Christ, whose name is above every name, the name at which every knee should bend and every tongue confess is Lord. Palm Sunday is a reminder of our tendency to look for a Savior who will make things happen according to our wishes. We tend to want a Savior who will assure us that we're pretty good, not needing too many tweaks, pretty good just as we are. We don't need to change our personal opinions or prejudices. We sort of want a Savior who will make us feel good, insulate us from pain, and not challenge us to any significant degree. But that Savior is not Jesus. The Holy Son of God emptied himself of his divine privilege and in its place was filled with all the imperfections, hurts, fears, and confusion of being human. All this he took with him as he died on the cross. In doing so, Jesus has opened up all humanity to the possibility of living in the freedom of God's love and mercy. Let's take a moment to reflect on what it means that we bear the name of Jesus, the name above all names. What does it mean to have the same mind as Jesus Christ? As we pause for a moment, we may think that having the same mind of Christ is humanly impossible. We are just not up to the task. But 
We aren't expected to do it on our own. The Spirit of Christ lives in us, nudging us, guiding us, giving us creative ideas, filling us with love for others. For some, having the mind of Christ is being an instrument of large systemic change in society. For others, the mind of Christ leads to a multitude of everyday life-changing acts of unselfish kindness and care that are evidenced in our lives and in the internal life of communities of faith and also in relationship with our immediate community and the larger world. People who live with their minds in sync with the mind of Christ are partakers with Christ in bringing the reign of God to this earth. Hosanna! God's kingdom has come and continues to come through the suffering servant, Jesus Christ. And a double Hosanna! God's kingdom comes as the Spirit of Christ is at work in people like you and me. Thanks be to God.